So it looks like everyone is on and ready to go. So I will go ahead and start us off and then hopefully more folks will be able to join us. So welcome everyone. My name is Emily Steers and I'm Civic Engagement Fellow for Queens University of Charlotte. Thank you for joining us for the third installment of our 2021 Lunch and Learn series. Before I introduce today's panelists, I want to let everyone know that if you have questions during the presentation, please post them in the chat box, and then I will relay them during our discussion portion of this session. Today, we are very honored to welcome several members of the Charlotte community. We have Ryan Carter from Habitat for Humanity of the Charlotte Region, Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education member at large, Jennifer De La Hara, Tina Postel, Executive Director of Loaves and Fishes, as well as representatives of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, Sergeant David McCallum, Detective Mike Wen, Officer Ryan Bottenmayer, and Dion Wimbush. And since we only have an hour with these phenomenal panelists, I will begin by asking them a few questions about their line of work and how they are working to address various aspects of life here in Charlotte. So once again, thank you all for being here today with us. And I'm actually going to start with Ryan. Um, he is my former boss. And so I'm gonna put him on the spot first and uh, we'll run through some questions. So Ryan, welcome. It's, it's great to see you again. Um, I wanted to kick things off by asking you a little bit about the most prevalent housing concerns in Charlotte at the moment. So what are they and how has the pandemic exacerbated the housing crisis and impacted individual families? Um, and also are there certain groups of people who are being more affected than others? Absolutely, thanks Emily and thank you for, for having me. It's great to see you and, and great to be with you all today. Um, certainly a lot to unpack there and it, it really depends on, on who you ask as to um, what are the most prevalent housing concerns. Uh, but what we have seen is that uh, even in a global pandemic, the Charlotte housing market has not slowed down. Uh, rent is going up, uh, home prices are going up. Um, I, brought, I bought my home uh, last year, the day uh, after the governor issued all stay-at-home orders. Um, and even in that, my home has gone up $90,000 in, in, in value. So this is not slowing down uh, and who's really been affected have been um, our low-income families, uh, looking at uh, parents, uh, families who have had to deal with childcare issues. Um, the, the racial wealth gap is, is a really big deal, and um, UNC Charlotte's Urban Institute put out a report, and I would encourage everyone to read it, uh, but that has only widened that, that gap. Uh, looking at uh, if you're able to have a job where you can work remotely, uh, so if you're working in service industries, chances are good you don't have that option. Um, if you have kids, someone has to watch out for them. Uh, you have to have Wi-Fi. Uh, we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Well, 21st century, you have to add Wi-Fi to that conversation as well. Um, so, so with the pandemic making life harder for lower income families, the fact that the Charlotte economy and housing market has not slowed down, uh, we see that um, the, the demand is higher than ever and the supply has all but stagnated. So um, those are kind of the, the big issues that we're seeing right now. Tent City obviously was the physical manifestation um, of a lot of issues regarding uh, houselessness, homelessness, um, and individuals and families kind of living on, on the edge there. Uh, but then just the astronomical exponential growth of, of the housing costs here in Charlotte. Absolutely, and I, and I think we've all seen that on the news and so to have a little bit of context for how and why that has happened is, is really useful. And so what strategies is Habitat Charlotte and maybe some of the other affiliates employing to address the current housing crisis in the area? Absolutely. So um, several things, right? So um, new home construction, I think we all have some sort of Habitat story. Uh, if you don't have one yet, I'm happy to uh, help you get your Habitat story about sometime you're on a Habitat build, right? So we, we build homes, uh, they are not free homes, but they, the mortgages are subsidized. So fun fact, if you have a Habitat home built in your neighborhood, it still appraises at market value. So uh, no worries there. So new home construction, uh, as well as our critical home repair program, uh, that's going in uh, and extending the life of homes. Uh, 
uh, also helps families age in place. Uh, it's one thing uh, we, if, if someone decides to sell their home, we want it to be just that, a choice, a decision. Um, not that I had to move out of my home because uh, the roof was falling in. Uh, and then our Money Matters program. Uh, buying a home is a big deal. Financing a home is also a big deal. So helping families get their credit scores up, uh, figuring out how to save, how do I uh, live an effective and, and cost-effective life. So, so those are some things. Um, but also, uh, we cannot build our way out of this housing crisis. And there are some systemic barriers that have been addressed. And so uh, my job, I don't wear a hard hat at Habitat. I get to wear a suit or have to wear a suit, I guess. Uh, and I work on legislation and advocacy. So what can we do to change those, those historical trends, those barriers? Uh, you think about one of our biggest initiatives that we did over the past two years, and uh, thank you, Emily, for your help with this, is addressing source of income discrimination. Um, and to you college students out there, if you've ever tried to uh, pay for an off-campus apartment with a student loan, uh, that is not guaranteed income. Uh, in the eyes of the landlord, even though you've received it from the bank. Uh, and so you can pay rent, but that is a huge issue that has been a systemic barrier um, to lots of families to find housing in Charlotte. So uh, whether that be vouchers, disability checks, social security, uh, student loan payments, uh, it, it's, it's imperative that if you can pay rent with a legal and verifiable source of income, that you'd be able to find a place to live. So that's a big one. Um, also, property tax reform, uh, property tax assistance, down payment assistance, that's a huge step. So um, this is some of the things that, that Habitat has been doing, uh, a, a short list of many of what we've been doing uh, to help increase and, and address the affordable housing crisis. Thank you for talking about that. And as I'm sure all of our participants can tell, if you know, you reach out to Habitat, they will put you to work. So, and there are a number of ways that you can help without putting on a hard hat if you so choose. So that's awesome. Thank you, Ryan, for that. And I know the conversation around gentrification in Charlotte has definitely come to the forefront of our conversations here in the area. So how does gentrification of Charlotte neighborhoods affect people of color and their ability to stay in their homes? Um, what poli policies or strategies have been implemented or are being discussed in the local government to balance the influx of new people and the needs of our established communities? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And and gentrification is such a tough word. Um, you know, people, there's, I think we all, we can close our eyes and you have a picture in your head of what is gentrification. Um, and if we open our eyes, we realize we all have a different perspective. So kind of, Zooming back out a little bit, looking at the broader picture of displacement. Uh, that's, you know, I'm no longer able to live where I am. Um, my neighborhood, I live in Plaza Shamrock. Uh, we have a, an apartment complex that's being liquidated right now. Uh, the developer is uh, the property manager and, and property owner is selling the, the property and forcing everybody out. Um, so, so they're being displaced. Um, no one, uh, gentrification also occurs uh, in, in my world primarily through property taxes. Uh, if you look at uh, Optimus Park, so if you've been over to Optimus Hall for some lunchtime goodies, um, the neighborhood right there is some of the original habitat homes. And their property values, since they were built in the late 70s, have gone up 400%. Now that's great for resale, it's catastrophic for your property tax bill if you're a senior citizen living on a fixed income. So those are some big things. The city has started an aging in place program uh, that is working to address that through property tax assistance. Um, the state has its homestead exemptions. Uh, that's also property tax assistance for low income seniors. Uh, I'm working at the state level to expand that. Um, so that's, we can talk about property taxes some other day. Um, it's one of my favorite uh, conversations at the bar. Um, so, so that's a, a really big issue. Um, and then now with the 2040 comprehensive plan, uh, there's a lot of great stuff in there uh, regarding displacement and gentrification, how we can address that. So uh, it's going to happen. Uh, gentrification, displacement, it's a natural process. Uh, we see it happening. 
uh, the, with the re-urbanization of, of America. It's hip, it's cool to live close into the city uh, and there are affordable homes there that can be gobbled up. So um, you look at that, that's a huge issue. Um, also, and trying to be respectful of, of time, of course, but uh, 2008 hit um, and a lot of subprime mortgages were directly targeted for low income minority homeowners. Uh, and so 2008 hit, you had massive foreclosures uh, in some of, a lot of inner city neighborhoods, particularly here in Charlotte, uh, investors gobbled them up. Uh, I had a home across the street from me sell uh, recently uh, to, to a family. It was a long-term rental owned by an investment firm from the Philippines. So this isn't just like Wall Street investors. This is international organizations buying up single family homes in Charlotte. So that means charlatans don't own Charlotte, which should be terrifying for everyone. Um, so uh, that's something that, that we definitely need to work on, on addressing is how do we pr increase and provide equity for, for residents, regardless if they're a homeowner or a renter. Thank you for sort of contextualizing what is a deeply complex issue. And I'm sure we will circle back to that at the end. Um, but we have so many phenomenal people that we've got to keep moving. So thank you so much, Ryan. And we'll probably circle back to some of those themes at the end during our question and answer session. And now I would like to invite Jennifer De La Hara up to the, uh, the mic here. And it's wonderful to see you again. And I look forward to hearing some of the answers to our questions and um, to kick us off, you know, the last year has really opened, I think all of our eyes to certain things about, you know, the school system here in Charlotte or wherever we live. And I think in a way that's, that's good, but also, you know, there's still a lot of questions out there. So can you speak to how Charlotte Mecklenburg school system is planning to address the gaps that currently exist in K-12 in Mecklenburg. Um, you know, these gaps have been here, but COVID has exacerbated them, I think, and, and it has made it very clear that the minority majority schools may not be receiving the same access and resources as others. So can you speak a little bit to the board's plan to address some of these issues? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for um, having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, this question is top of mind um, for myself as well as for all of our, the board members. And you're absolutely right that opportunity gaps exist in all parts of our community and have. Um, but COVID has brought those gaps into sharper focus. Um, there is no magic bullet that will solve the deep continuing legacy of our disparities, many of which of course are rooted in systemic racism in our community, which exhibits itself in racial disparities and everything from wealth accumulation to um, health outcomes and of course, you know, to education. But CMS is, works to address both the immediate needs of our students and also address the root causes of these inequities. And I'll explain a little bit um, about that. Um, as part of our anti-racist work, for example, CMS is reviewing and changing policies and practices that have disparate racial impacts. This work has led um, to several uh, areas, uh, changes, I should say, in several areas, uh, from student discipline to employment practices. Staff at all levels are actively participating in anti-racist workshops, professional development, book clubs, trainings, etc. At the school level, we have adopted a new English language um, arts curriculum um, that's intentional with the content uh, that's more reflective of the lived experiences of our students. It's more um, culturally relevant, if you will, and I think that's really important that we have those opportunities for our students and our teachers um, and the professional development that accompanies that. Um, CMS is also working to ensure that all of our students have access to the same grade level um, standards aligned curriculum at every school. And we didn't necessarily have that several years ago. We had a lot of different curricula. And so we've worked hard to adopt um, the same grade level standards aligned curricula so that we can call all of our students higher. And key to the success of this is helping our teachers understand also the brilliance of their students 
um, rather than their deficits. It's sort of a, a shift in, in, in the thinking of how we go about teaching. Um, thanks to our funding from our county funding partner, CMS is also able to assign more um, staff resources to high needs schools. Um, federal Title I funds also allow us to provide additional staff um, to schools that, that exhibit the need. A um, couple other things, the CMS board has also established a community equity committee um, to help us focus the eyes of the community on this important work. And we're very pleased that the, of the work of that committee. It's led to actual changes, the policy changes, you know, related to our disciplinary policies, for example. Um, and lastly, before I get off this question, let me just also mention, I, I just want to thank you for inviting CMS to the table here today to answer, I mean, me as just one representative, but to help answer some of these questions. I've, I've sort of noticed a trend in our community where folks gather to, you know, sort of talk about the stigma that we have of being 50th out of 50, and I know some folks are tired of hearing that, but, but people will speak about it in the sense of upward, upward mobility, um, but not necessarily in center the traditional public school system as a means for how we can address that and you know, break the chains of poverty, the cycle of poverty, if you will. Um, and I really think it's important that we are here you know, at the table naming what our disparities are, our strategies to overcome them, and identifying the help that we need from the community. Um, so thank you for letting me speak to that specifically today. Absolutely, and, and I think that gets to exactly why we're doing this today, because, you know, we are sort of bombarded on all sides with different news sources and, and information coming at us, and so we sometimes miss the phenomenal work that's being done that we don't always see face to face. Um, so by providing this opportunity and being able to speak with you almost one on one uh, in a virtual space, hopefully that will help others to realize that these issues aren't being ignored and, and that we are talking about them. So thank you thank as you. well for being here. And one of the other things that a lot of folks have been talking about lately are the after school programs and the fact that they have recently been cut, which creates another struggle for childcare and also has created more layoffs for CMS employees. So can you walk us through a little bit about that decision and what other options may be in place to address this major change to people's lives? Yes. So the after school enrichment program, uh, commonly known as ASEP, that decision has been very difficult, a difficult one for us to make. Um, the ASEP program is an enterprise fund. And what that means is, is that it must be self-sustaining. Uh, we don't get funds. And of course, the school board doesn't have any taxing authority. We're completely reliant upon federal, state, and county funds to, to operate. But this particular um, aspect of our organization is separate from even all that and it's an enterprise fund. So the fees of the program must cover its costs, just like any other business, any other if I were running a daycare program, if you will. Um, this year we have seen a dramatic drop in ASEP enrollment to the point where CMS was losing over $800,000 per month on the program. And we just simply could not continue to cover those losses. Uh, it was a balance of trying to offer the program, obviously not wanting to, to lay off our employees and, and trying to look at, you know, what the future would hold and being very uncertain about that future. I know there's a lot of disappointment in the community um, that this has inconvenienced and there's a certain expectation that we would stay open, but we've had to sort of balance that critical need for daycare with the fact that daycare is not our core charter. Our core charter is K-12 education. And you know, Mecklenburg is a little unique in that we do have all of these after-school programs where in a lot of other counties they may have some, but a lot of students go off-site to other daycare programs. And we have worked that out in our county where we would have that on-site. And it's been a great convenience for many of our families. But much like any other business, um, it was becoming uh, very difficult to stay open and we had to question if our federal money that we were giving for COVID relief should really be used for daycare 
which is essentially what it is after school care, as opposed to um, our core charter, which is much needed funds that we need to address all the disparities that I answered in the last question <laughs> that have been exacerbated by um, COVID because uh, we have a lot of building back work to do, right? So, um, you know, it is possible that with the move for four days a week, uh, which is now how we've moved our elementary school students in, that the, uh, the enrollment will increase. And as sites see a surge in increase, um, uh, see a surge in enrollment, then it becomes more self-sustaining. And uh, we have 24, if we have 24 students at any site, then we can self-sustain that program. And uh, we're looking now, and in fact, we'll probably make a board decision tonight that will keep some more of those open. And then it's our hope and expectation that we'll re resume to full ASAP um, programming in the fall as COVID continues to, uh, you know, go away. That's what we all hope anyway, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you for delving a little bit more into that. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends in Charlotte with kids and, and so that has been, you know, on the forefront of their minds, but I appreciate you walking us through that. Um, and, and the other thing, we're, we're sort of hitting you on all sides here, but <laughs> <It's okay>. um, <laughs> One of the biggest things that has been in, I think, the statewide conversation is the fact that North Carolina is one of the lowest paying states for recruiting new teachers. And many North Carolina teachers are moving to other states or leaving teaching to pursue a different career that will give them a living wage. Um, so with low wages for North Carolina teachers, what's the board's plan to recruit and retain quality teachers for the Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this actually. This is um, critically important. Um, teacher recruitment and retention are crucial to the success of, of any school system. And you're right, we do lose many educators to other professions or sometimes other states uh, if, they could, if they can cross the line, uh, the state line. We are working to build a pipeline of teachers through what's known as our um, CMS teacher residency program. It's um, similar to what um, used to be known as uh, lateral entry. Um, some of our listeners today may remember that, where we bring in other other paraprofessionals or just professionals in the community that have different backgrounds but want to make a transition into education. So that is the one of the ways that we are specifically targeting to increase our pipeline. We also have specific recruitment efforts uh, and partnerships to target and support educators of color. Um, and also our new teachers. So it's one thing when we do get teachers, whether they're coming in as from the teacher residency or straight from a four-year education program, we have to have the right supports in place. Um, those first three, three years are very critical um, to helping them get the support that they need so that they will stay, right? So those, those sort of things are incredibly important to us. Um, you mentioned the low pay. And I, I guess I, I do want to speak to that also because I can't overemphasize how critically important that is. And sometimes I get posed the question in the way almost of like, you know, well, we have low pay, there's not much we can do about that. So what are you gonna do anyway to overcome this? And that's not necessarily the way you asked it, but I wanna set it in that context because I really think that it's important that we name the fact that our teachers are so are paid so incredibly on a low scale because make no mistake that the wages absolutely matter we have seen in north carolina in the past few years a plummet of 35 percent decrease in enrollment in four-year teacher education programs. And it is the actual pay, but it's also things have been taken away, like benefits. Any teacher that started this year, January 1st of 2021, will no longer have benefits that teachers started, if you started December 30th, would get in your retirement with having health insurance paid for and things like that. So it just seems like we're ticking away and ticking away and not honoring master's level pay, et cetera. And I often say to folks, you know, we don't have a teacher shortage. And some, you may see memes on this on social media. What we have is a, 40, um, a master's level professional um, who doesn't want to work for $40,000 a year. 
And I think it's, you know, one of the things that we can do, and certainly me as a board member, is advocate to you all and the public to say, we need your help. I think we need to push back, um, certainly with our Mecklenburg delegation um, here and to the General Assembly, but also to the leadership in Raleigh and say, um, this is critical. You know, North Carolina is 49th in, this, in the country with its education funding when you compare it against our general wealth, when you're looking at our tax base and our GDP. And I think we can do better. So education funding across the board is low. And as it relates to our teacher, it's, it's absolutely critical that we all speak out and demand more for our teachers. And I sort of wanted to put that plug in there that we will do the best we can um, to overcome those challenges. But I think as a society, we really need to stand up and, and, and demand more. So I, I welcome the engagement to that end. And um, you know, at the end of this, or when I finish speaking, I'll drop my email in. And if anyone's interested in speaking to me more about it, on how we can engage uh, you know, with uh, actual policy and funding change, I'd be happy to speak with someone. Thank you so much for that offer. And also, you know, I think we're seeing a theme of using our individual political agency to enact change in the areas in which we are most impacted. So I appreciate you outlining those different ways that we can help as uh, residents of this area. And we can definitely circle back to some of those themes at the end. Again, I would like to remind everyone that you can put questions in and we will get to them right at the end. So thank you so much, uh, Ms. De Lajara. And now we're going to transition to the officers and representatives of Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. Uh, it's lovely to see you all again and to be able to be in conversation with you once more. And to kick the topic off, um, I think a lot of our conversations over the last year, just as with everything else we've just talked about has been affected by the pandemic, uh, but also by the deaths of so many black people and, and other people of color uh, just yesterday with the shooting in Boulder and the shooting in Atlanta over the weekend. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about how CMPD has been impacted since the events surrounding and extending uh, after the murder of George Floyd and also, of course, Breonna Taylor, Maude Arbery, and everyone. Uh, how has that affected you know, your new cadets, community attitudes, uh, compliance from the community, et cetera? Okay. Well, thank you again. Well, we're so happy to be here. Um, um, that is a very loaded question. Um, and it's and it's hard it's hard to kind of really put your finger on totally um, how is it it, it is impacted CMPD as a whole. Um, I can say that um, for all of us who, who witnessed what happened to George Floyd, and being in law enforcement myself for the past fifteen years, and I think collectively between the three officers here, we have around close to sixty years of law enforcement experience. So that issue, that that situation was tragic, and um, it was hard to watch um, to see that. Um, what I can talk about is here at CMPD, the things that we've done to ensure that a situation such as that doesn't occur here. Um, we we are in compliance with the eight can't wait. Uh, we've uh, revised our do, our directives here for our duty to act, which means that. An officer witnesses a situation such as that or a person, an officer using excessive force, that officer has a duty to intervene and act, and act on behalf of that citizen. Even if they're making an arrest, we have a duty to act to save and preserve life. Um, our response to resistance directives have been updated and implemented to be more, to have more transparency with the public and the community, and as well as to just to make sure that we are on the same page with our community that we serve. Um, employee wellness is a huge part for us here at CMPD. It's one of our pillars for our, um, our core four for the chief. And uh, he is, uh, he's, he's really 
encourage us to move and then to be very proactive in carrying that out, making sure that we kind of check in with our officers and see how they're doing and, and, and ensure that they're um, ensure that they're acting responsibly in dealing with the stresses, some of the stresses that come with being an officer and some of the things that we have to interact with people on a daily basis. And if I could get you to repeat the second part of the question, I'm not sure if I touched on everything. Absolutely. I guess we just wanted to know a little bit about how that's maybe impacted, you know, everything that's that's changing and evolving. How has that impacted the new cadets coming into the program, um, community attitudes towards CMPD, and also, you know, compliance from the community in terms of what you all are, are doing? So uh, back in 2016, during those uh, demonstration protests, uh, the, uh, a unit was created, it was a constructive conversation team. Um, and that unit went out and uh, created an open dialogue between people that wanted their voice to be heard. I uh, get the opportunity for people to discuss issues with an officer. Um, back uh, when uh, Joyce Floyd's uh, death and the protests across the nation took place here in Charlotte, we had some protests here, uh, that team was deployed. And it's just creating open dialogue just for people, for officers to be available for discussion. And what was so great about having that team out there was the, the dialogue that was created, the relationships and connections we made with different individuals and organizations. And today, the work we're doing with those organizations with uh, boots on the ground, so that partnership is uh, instrumental with uh, what, we, what we do today. Some of those organizations are like Revamp, uh, Behind Every Story. So these are grassroots organizations, and they're doing a lot of heavy lifting alongside us. Um, and uh, so that's what has, uh, has changed a little bit. Um, with our cadets, um, our college cadet program, and also our recruits, is we're showing them how to serve the community. Uh, that is very important. Uh, the academy, that teaches them how to become a police officer tactics, but as a college cadet, uh, going out and working in the community is very important. They can learn how to communicate. They uh, learn empathy, understanding, these things that the academy, academy might not be able to teach. We can teach them uh, with uh, our partners and what we're doing and the work we do here. It's so instrumental. And we couldn't do it without the community and the organizations that partner with us. Just to follow up what Officer Bonatoni just mentioned, just so you know, when you said the impact, all along, CMPD has been doing that. So I want to make sure that people out here understand that um, we have always been progressive as far as serving our community, right? So this right here is just make it more that we need to, of course, in anything we do, we all will be better. So I don't want you to think that we just all suddenly change all the tactics because of this. A lot of times people get confused because the United States has many, many, different departments. So what one policy, one department, the necessary is different from us. So the chokehold, the no more entry, right? No not entry. All those things that we have in place and we don't do that here. But a lot of times people see it on TV and other department, they assume that all departments are doing that. So we have different policies. And our policy books are this thick because we there's things that we don't do, right? Or, so with all that being said, uh, I'll go back to Chief Jenny. Um, we could continue to police in a way that the community, the community wants to do this. And that's the main goal. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll add, even as a civilian employee, um, and just a little bit of background, you know, I'm somebody that grew up in an area that didn't have a great relationship with the police. I'm from Atlanta, the south side of town. And so uh, it was after um, the Michael Brown shooting, you know, I was tired of being upset with officers, tired of protesting and marching. So like, what can I do to make like a boots on the ground kind of difference? And so I'm fortunate to come alongside, work with these officers, and it's been transformative for me to see what it's like to be an officer, being around them, but also being able to help build bridges within the community uh, to form those relationships, right? Because whenever there's an officer-involved shooting, no matter what part of the country it's in, all police departments come under scrutiny, right? And I, and I get that. But one of the things that, you know, unfortunately in the media, you don't see the ongoing commitment that we have to service. You know, we do a weekly food district and we've been doing this since the pandemic started, right? That doesn't get a lot of coverage. So there's ongoing commitments that we have. And even in terms of trying to change 
um, community's attitudes, that's something hard to do when you think about the history of policing. You know what I mean? And how it started, uh, even up until this point. So it's hard to change community attitudes. That doesn't happen overnight. But one of the things that I believe in is when you commit to something, you do that consistently, that becomes a part of your identity. And there are those that, that see that, you know, and see our ongoing commitment. And they're more inclined to, to believe in the work that we're doing and to trust. But that takes time. That, that's not anything you can do. Uh, it's not like an easy button. You push and the slate is wiped clean. So it's always going to be more work to do to change those attitudes and beliefs. Thank you all for, for speaking to that and, and the various efforts that I think the community doesn't hear about very often, you know, the food program that was mentioned and, and some of the changes that have been made internally since everything has gone on. And I want to also get back to something that we talked about the other night at uh, the event on the common read. And, you know, I, I would be interested to hear a little bit about how the protests and the different things that happened with Black Lives Matter over the last year, how has that impacted your role and, and the way that you maybe interact with the community and how has that shaped now your uh, understanding of maybe how Charlotte views CMPD and vice versa? Um, I think uh, one of the things that that movement has brought is like awareness level, you know, awareness to our policies, looking at them, some of the changes. And I think that's what's most important uh, is uh, looking at that kind of stuff and, you know, updating it. Uh, recently, our chief has updated our mission, uh, our mission and our vision as the four core uh, values. Uh, and that stuff hadn't been updated until like 1993. So. Uh, you know, it's always great looking at things. Also, uh, some of the things that we've been doing is uh, our Race Matters class, and sending officers to uh, the Juvenile Justice Race Matters uh, class, and that's been beneficial. They actually started with uh, uh, command staff and working the way down with uh, some of that training. So uh, I, I like that view because it, it puts the, the heavy weight on our uh, leaders within the organization and then they can set the standard for everybody else. So I like that working with uh, the top uh, down. So that, that format, anybody else would like that? Yeah. Uh, just, to, just to touch on the, the, the points that Officer Bossmeyer was um, making. Um, it has, uh, Black Matters, Black Lives Matter movement has enhanced our awareness uh, and, and encouraged us to move forward and continue to be one of the more progressive police departments in our country. Um, as Officer Bossmeyer spoke, the racial equity and um, race matters doing our justice class, it, it exposes officers to a lot of the historical things that have happened um, um, so that you can kind of, you can kind of get a viewpoint and kind of see into where the Black Lives Matter movement started and kind of that historical, that foundation of things to get a better understanding. And understand that you know when we're out here in the street and you interact with someone who has questions, you can be knowledgeable about where they're coming from and how they may address you as an officer. And once they see you in uniform, you'll be better prepared to have those conversations. Um, one thing I want to talk about is something that was added uh, a few years ago to our academy class. They do a bus tour throughout Charlotte. And basically, it talks about uh, some of the issues the history sergeant uh, was talking about, and it opens the, uh, your eyes to what has taken place and how we got here today. And being a Charlottean, I was uh, unaware of some of that history, so it is great uh, to show people. And some of our recruits uh, that's coming to our department uh, are not from Charlotte, so it opens their eyes to our history. Um, also, I'm going to add uh, the poverty simulation. We're doing that with the recruits and also with command staff, and we're adding more officers as we can. But that gives uh, officers the ability, uh, if you're not unaware of the poverty, poverty simulation, participants take a role of a family, a low-income in family, 
and they have to they have to navigate the, the systems uh, that's in place uh, to make payment, pay rent, pay daycare, uh, get their kids to school with no transportation, uh, with limited funds, go find a job, and it, it gives the officers uh, the ability to have an understanding of what somebody in the community might be going through. Uh, and how that translates to our job is, uh, for instance, if we stop somebody for some type of regulatory issue with their vehicle, um, understanding what that person might be going through and what other resources we can use to help that person out. Um, you know, can we use a warning citation and that person has the ability to have some additional time to go take care of that issue? Um, or do we know some other partners that, are, uh, that, are, that can assist the family? So it's so beneficial uh, having this additional training. Um, finally, I'll just add, you know, we, you know, we're human beings too. And that's, that's one of the biggest things I learned about working with officers, right? Like they have families, um, they have, you know, things that come up, right? And so when we see the events like George Floyd, or even the, you know, the uprising at the, the Capitol, the nation's Capitol, right? We're deeply impacted by those too. And those inform our conversations over lunch. And so, you know, a lot of times people talk about systemic racism, uh, racism and systemic issues, and I always say, well, systems are all made up of people, right? Individuals who are raised in a particular context that informs their views, right? And so, uh, one, the, it, in order to grow and evolve, right, it's important to have conversations and even look within to see, okay, what are some beliefs that I might have been taught uh, as a child by my parents or my community that I might need to give up? Or maybe there's a different way of understanding issues like the flag. You know, we, we've had conversations about that, you know, why some people protest the flag and why some may take offense to people who protest the flag, right? And so until you can understand people's context and have those kind of conversations, which we do, right, and which we encourage even among other officers as well, I think that's where you see the, the big change, the bigger change, the systemic change, it happens on that level. Thank you so much for, for speaking to that because, you know, that's what we're trying to do here today. Obviously, we're not, you know, in the same space, but, you know, just breaking down some of these perceptions by having these conversations is, is so critical to the work that you're doing in the community and how, you know, me as a resident of Charlotte now will think about the ways in which I interact with you and, and maybe some of the things that I thought um, about CMPD as a whole. So that is wonderful and I, and I really appreciate your perspectives on that. And we are now going to transition since we are coming to our uh, conclusion here in, in just a few minutes. We're going to transition to Miss Tina Postel. Thank you um, to the officers and representatives of CMPD and I'm sure we'll have questions for you right there at the end. And so welcome to the mic, Ms. Tina Postel uh, from Lowe's and Fishes. We're very excited to have you here today. If you could, uh, would you mind sharing about Lowe's and Fishes, the work that you're doing in the community, and provide an idea of the services that you provided pre-COVID and maybe how that's changed since the pandemic has begun? Absolutely. <laughs> So thank you for having me. Um, I am the executive director of Loaves and Fishes and Loaves and Fishes, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, we are a network of emergency food pantries. And so we provide a week's worth of nutritionally balanced groceries, nutritionally balanced meaning food from all five food groups. So grains, fruits, vegetables, dairy, and proteins uh, for anybody who's in need on a short-term basis. And so we have been in existence since 1975. And uh, we used to, we opened our first pantry at Holy Comfort or Episcopal Church. And in that first year, we served a thousand people. Um, 46 years later, uh, in 2020, we just served 120,000 individuals, if you can believe that. That's how many people needed to rely on a network of emergency food pantries in order to put food around their table. Um, Pre-COVID, we prided ourselves at Loaves and Fishes on client choice shopping. And so anybody who was referred to us um, was able to show up at one of our full-size pantries and they actually pushed a shopping cart around and they selected 
food from all five food groups and they walked up and down the aisle of, you know, similar to what a miniature grocery store might be like. And they selected which fruits, which vegetables, which grains, which proteins they wanted for themselves and for their family. And so they got enough, they left with enough food to feed everybody in their household. So a family of five was going to leave with five times as much food as an individual. And so when COVID hit, most of our pantry locations are operated by volunteers, many of whom were elderly um, and retired and had the time to work at a food pantry. And so when COVID hit, um, we knew that we needed to pivot in a new and different way because food demand went through the roof. But at the same time, we couldn't expose our volunteers um, to the danger of contracting uh, COVID-19. And so almost overnight, we had to close all of our brick and mortar locations, um, but we knew that we needed to figure out a new way to feed the masses. And so we created what's called mobile pantries. And so now, um, and still to this day, we're operating mobile pantries, uh, 20 plus all around Mecklenburg County each and every week, where clients who are referred to us don't even get out of their vehicle they simply drive up, we check them in, and then they pop open the trunk of their car or the back seat, and we load them up with pre-packed food boxes. So unfortunately, during this time, they've lost the opportunity to select which items, but we still make sure that we load them up with a, with a, with a diverse variety of food from all five food groups. Um, and in addition to that, we also knew early on that we didn't want people who had tested positive for COVID-19 to even be driving through our food line. Uh, we needed to keep our volunteers and our staff members safe. So we started a first of its kind home delivery program. So um, it's an Instacart of sorts, uh, but it's all done by volunteers and loaves and fishes. And we will deliver groceries straight to someone's doorstep. So it's still a contactless delivery. Um, but we're delivering groceries to about 350 individuals each and every week who A, either tested positive or were, exco or were exposed to COVID-19 um, and should not be out, you know, in a grocery store or in a food line. Or B, we did expand the program. We had so many individuals that hadn't tested positive for COVID-19, but really just lacked adequate transportation. You know, I had one gentleman in particular when I was out working a mobile and he showed up with his face mask on, but you could see blood and drool dripping from his mouth. And he was an elderly gentleman. He had just gotten off the bus. And here we loaded this gentleman up with food. And I said, sir, do you, do you mind me asking how you're going to get that home? And he said, well, I'm going to take the bus back home. And I said, and, and what's going, it looks like you're injured here. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I just, you know, I don't have a car, but my doctor made me an appointment and I just had uh, he had had a root canal or oral surgery done on his mouth that day and anesthesia was still wearing off. And so I thought, oh my goodness, this gentleman should A, not be riding a bus um, to come and get groceries. And so we, you know, the home delivery program was born. So, um, so that's what we do. We also have a third program. So we have mobile pantries. We also have home deliveries. We have a third program just because we often get excess wonderful food donated that has a very short shelf life. Um, sometimes it's milk, apples, oranges, you name it, all these perishable items. And uh, we don't want it to end up in a landfill, but we can't often move it fast enough. And so we created a third program called a food share that you don't need a referral for anyone who uh, identifies as food insecure and just needs a little extra food can sign up on our website or sign up on site at one of our food shares. And it's not a full week's worth of food, it's just extra perishable items that we have available. And we do those all throughout Mecklenburg County too. So that was a really long introduction to what we do. <laughs> That's phenomenal though. I, I appreciate you outlining that for us. Um, I know that, you know, maybe pre, COVID, your clientele looked a little bit different than it does now. Um, so could you speak a little bit about folks you were seeing prior to the pandemic and then now what that looks like, especially, you know, for college students? I think we've seen a rise in my age group needing food. And so I, I would be interested to hear 
what you've seen and, and how that has impacted your work. Absolutely. And uh, so many of you are not on the video portion of today's call, but I would, I would say that if you want to know what a hungry person looks like, you're looking at it. I mean, a hungry person looks like the rest of us. Um, and that was, a, that was a stereotype or a misnomer that I even needed to get over when I was new to loaves and fishes five years ago. In my mind, a hungry person looked like that panhandler that you might see on the side of the street, right? A homeless individual holding a cardboard sign that says, we'll work for food. And not that we don't serve homeless individuals here at Lopes and Fishes, but I have to tell you, that's not typically who we serve. That's not who's shopping at our food pantry. People are always surprised to learn that nearly half of the people that we serve at our food pantries are children and seniors. And yes, indeed, college students are hungry students too. Um, you know, there was always the, the long running jokes about college students eating ramen, but for far too many college students, that's the truth. After you pay tuition and textbooks, sometimes there's just not enough food left over. And so we certainly saw all of those same faces pre-COVID and during COVID. But what we saw during COVID was a dramatic increase in the number of people that needed to be served. Oh my goodness, we went from serving about a thousand people a month to over 5,000 people in a month's time, if you can believe that. So overnight, um, demand was just through the roof. Um, interesting to note, we do, we do um, collect data on everybody that we serve, and I monitor it very closely to see what zip codes people live in. What are the ethnicities and races and genders and ages of the people that we're serving so that I can better produce a picture of what hungry people look like. We saw a dramatic increase in the number of Latinx families that we were serving at the beginning of the pandemic and it continues to remain high. So Loaves and Fishes historically has always served about 80% of our clients are, are um, black, Indian, people of color, right? Um, and that did not change. It actually bumped up to 85% uh, during COVID, but we saw the most dramatic increase in um, people of that were Latinx. And so it went from 15% uh, to 37% um, of, of, of our Latinx neighbors needed assistance. They needed help. And, and many of them were fearful to ask for help um, or, or worried about you know, us documenting that they needed the help. Um, so that's typically what our clientele looks like, um, but it looks like you and me. I mean, many of the families are working. Um, oftentimes, you know, there's that assumption, oh, if they would just get a job. Many of our families are gainfully employed, but they're underpaid or life happens, right? Rent goes up, utilities go up, their child needs an expensive asthma medication, um, you name it. There's any one of us could be one paycheck away um, from needing to reach out to loaves and fishes. Absolutely, thank you for that. And, and you know, defining that we often don't necessarily see hunger. We see, you know, our friends, our neighbors, our family, and that can sometimes not be on the forefront of our minds. And yet, it, you know, this has exacerbated this entire issue. And so I appreciate the work that you've done and uh, continue to do for the people in our community. And we did actually have someone who asked you if, uh, if they were looking to donate, um, is there an Amazon wish list or could they do a direct financial donation? The answer to that is all of the above. Yes, um, Amazon wish list. Uh, if you go to our website, we have our Amazon wish list posted. We have our highest priority need items. You can also donate directly online. You can come and take a tour of our warehouse. If you know where Costco's at off of Tyvola, we're in a warehouse park behind that and we will gladly accept your donation. And if you wear closed toed shoes, we might even put you to work and you can help us sort and pack some of those food boxes. Wonderful, thank you so much. And you have spoken a little bit to this as board member De La Hara has as well in terms of how 
people can get involved in the work that you're doing. And um, I would like to circle back in the couple of minutes that we have left um, to Ryan and to our CMPD members. And maybe if you could just describe ways in which people can continue to connect with the work that you're doing and potentially support you. So Ryan, I'll start with you. Absolutely. Um, so do what Emily did, shoot me an email. Um, I'll, I'll drop my email uh, here in the chat box. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Uh, you can, I know if you're a, an old fogey like me and have a Facebook page, join our advocacy Facebook group. Um, I drop uh, articles in there about housing uh, and that's kind of our, our quick militia for, for quick action. So um, keep talking about housing. Uh, talk about it with your peers. Talk about how is this relevant to you, right? Uh, if you have uh, every, every college campus has that one dorm uh, that has terrible mold in the showers or something gross like that. Well, people live in that every day who aren't in college, right? Um, so how does that make you feel to have to live like that and, and to be exposed to that. Uh, having danger in the hallway. Uh, I, I remember the, the kicker from my college lived on my floor and practiced his kicks in the middle of the night, right? That terrified me. Uh, so what does safety mean in housing? So uh, keep talking about it, keep thinking about it, uh, and shoot, shoot me an email, I'd love to talk more. As I said before, he will put you to work. So uh, don't, don't take him lightly on that offer. And uh, <laughs> I, I loved my time at Habitat and learned far more than I ever expected, especially in terms of, you know, lobbying and how do you, how do you impact those in your community by lobbying local governments. So, and I finally want to end with uh, our representatives from CMPD. If, if folks are looking to continue this conversation with you or to support your work, how can they do that? So there's, there's many ways. Of course, you know, you can always go to cmpd.org. Or we're with community engagement. We have all types of programs ranging from uh, Mr. Dion was talking about the food. And I noticed that there was a friendship trade. And I have a good story about that. It says, when the COVID start, uh, we reach out to them because we realize a lot of volunteers that normally deliver for the old elderly can't do it anymore. So I reach out to them and uh, we had a big team that every day we went and lived with these, these folks. And we would bring our cadets in and to show them that there's a population that we cannot forget about just because they're out, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. And that was a great opportunity, not just for deliver the food to them, but also a teaching moment to their young folks, right? Future police officers. But for us, uh, of course, uh, I think Officer Botsmeyer just uh, sent you guys an email to our social account on leader. Start with him, of course, you know, we trickle down. So anything we can help out with the, uh, more dialogue, engagement, working with kids, working with, uh, you know, food pantry, whatever we need. We have these in place that we always can recruit to help out. That's phenomenal. Thank you so much. And that will conclude our lunch and learn for today. Thank you to all of the attendees for joining us and especially thank you to our panelists for the information and insights you provided today. I think sometimes we don't always get an opportunity like this to speak to so many phenomenal people who are doing the work and um, you know, making that positive change that we want to see in our communities. And so the fact that we now get to hear about that and be in partnership with you, I think is just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. So thank you again so much. And for all of our attendees or even our panelists, if you want to, uh, our next Lunch and Learn series will be on April 13th and it will cover how to advocate, organize, and lobby your elected officials and the importance of keeping up political momentum after the election. We will be welcoming Callie Pruitt, who is a brilliant young woman working in the field of advocacy and lobbying. And as always, if you're interested in hearing more about future Lunch and Learn events or other work being done by the Wells Fargo Center for Community Engagement, feel free to follow us on Instagram at QU underscore votes. Thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your week.